Good morning, everyone. Yes, it's me, Brian Gibson, and we're live streaming uh, the service this morning from the church building. In previous weeks, Dean Moore did a magnificent job spending many hours putting together pre-recorded parts of a service. This month, we're giving Dean a break, and we're live streaming the service in a simpler form from the church building here. It seems very strange to be in this building without noise and happy uh, chatter. And you're probably wondering when uh, a, a service, a normal service in this church building will resume. But just to reassure you that our minister, the Reverend Alvin Little and the elders have been thinking about this and praying about this and when he returns from a, a well-earned rest and holiday, they will be looking again at how to recommence services here in this building. There is a little video going around at the moment giving advice as to how we might uh, conduct worship here in the church. And it includes advice about serving tea and coffee. And uh, it suggests that we can continue to serve tea and coffee but it will be done in a different way. You won't go to the front, but what you will do when you return is you will sit in your seat, hold your head back, social distancing. Alvin and Sonia will be in the pulpit with large water pistols, one full of coffee, one full of tea. And then, according to your choice, they will squirt the coffee or tea into your mouth. So that's how uh, tea and coffee will be served when you return. And what we're asking you to do is to practice at home. So after morning service, we're asking one person to get a water pistol, fill it with tea or coffee. The other person sit across the room on a chair and you can practice receiving coffee from a water pistol. And then you'll be proficient when you return to this building. But being seri more serious... Uh, do pray for our minister and the elders as they wrestle with the issue of how to recommence worship here in this building. As we come to worship this morning, I want to read some words from uh, the book of Isaiah. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? or with the breadth of, breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counsellor? With whom will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. The wonderful words of the prophet Isaiah. He speaks of the God that we come this morning to worship. The God we meet in Christ. The God we meet when we worship in the right attitude and with open honesty. Let us pray together. Our Father, we come to lift up our hearts in praise and thanksgiving. We worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who created us, 
the one who sustains our lives and provides for us. You are the one who created us and you want to recreate us and bring us back into fellowship with yourself. Help us so to worship now, wherever we may be, whatever our circumstances. Amen.
Today, Brian's going to be talking to us uh, about Psalm number 8. And so we're going to read it together now. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honour. You made him a ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Psalm 8 is uh, one of my favourite psalms. And if you have your Bible in front of you and you want to look at it, you will notice, first of all, that the first and last stanza are exactly the same. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. They provide a frame around the picture of the psalm. This psalm, as far as we know, was written by David. Uh, and here he expresses his appreciation of the beauty of our world. And he proclaims that in such beauty, we see the hand of our creator. As a young boy, David was the youngest in, uh, of a large family. And he spent his early years looking after his father's sheep. In the morning, he would take them out as the sun was coming up to, to find green pasture and fresh water. And during the day, he would watch over his sheep and make sure that they weren't uh, uh, attacked by wild animals. He would also have spent quite a bit of time admiring the beauty of the countryside around him. And then as the sun set, he would make, take his sheep, lead his sheep back to the fold. And as he did so, he would gaze up into the heavens and see the beauty of the stars and he rejoiced in the wonder and beauty of his heavenly father's creation. COVID-19 has affected us in many, many unfortunate ways. But I think one of the benefits of this period has been uh, that it has given us an opportunity, all of us, to stop and rest and uh, an opportunity to enjoy in a new way God's creation. We have had time to watch nature bursting into bloom. We have had time to listen to the songs of the birds. We have had time to watch the moods of the sea and the texture and colours of the cloud, particularly in the evenings. We have had time to recognise God's hand in creation. There's only one thing that I would complain about, and that is the incessant noise of the wood pigeons who are nesting in a tree beside our house. And I'm also praying that God will redirect the flight path of our seagulls, because having had the roof of our conservatory washed by the rain, the seagulls have made a mess of it again. But in creation, in creation we see the hand of our loving, creative, heavenly Father. David said, Lord, our Lord, 
How majestic is your name in all the earth. But you know, there's another and a more important truth in this psalm. Because the psalm suddenly switches from talking about creation to talking about people. We have almost a rhetorical question in verse 3 and 4, where David says, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man? What is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Now the obvious answer to that might be that individually we are totally insignificant. We're one in billions. We have little influence in the whole picture and story of history. And yet we have an unexpected answer to this question. David says you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Now, this is not a truth that David came to by observation. This is a revealed truth. This is a truth which he would have found in the law, the ancient scriptures. And of course, it reflects the teaching of Genesis, where having created our world and our universe, God crowns his creation with the creation of human beings who are created in his own image. The Old Testament world, when David wrote this psalm, had many differing religions and many gods. And many of these religions had temples, and in those temples there would be an image of the God that they worshipped. And of course, we still find that in our world today. Uh, Gene and I have been watching Michael Pertillo's travel series where he travels by train and he follows his Bradshaw Travel Guide, a wonderful series of programs. And recently we watched one where he was in Java and he went to the Bara Budar Temple. I hope I pronounced that almost right. But this huge construction in Java is made up of hundreds of little temples. And inside each temple there is a statue of Buddha. The religion of David's day would have had many temples and many images of God. But in the Hebrew religion, we're strictly told that there should never be an image made of God. Where the, the, one, the commandment is, thou shalt not make any graven image. We're told that we should not bow down to anything which seeks to replicate or, or be an image of the God that we worship. And why is this? Why is this the instruction in Scripture? And the simple answer is this, that we are the true image of the living God. God has chosen to make make himself known in us. What a challenge. I, I find that a staggering truth, that God has chosen to make himself known in you and in me. And when I really ponder that truth, I feel a bit like Adam and Eve. I want to go and hide behind a tree because I recognize my moral and spiritual nakedness. I should be a better husband. I should be a better father. I should have been a better minister. I should be a better neighbor. I am meant to represent God in the world in which we live. The psalmist tells us that God has created us as the crowning piece of his creation. That's an amazing truth, a wonderful truth, but deeply challenging. 
So what are the truths which flow from this particular truth? Well, firstly, can I suggest to you that it follows that human life is a sacred gift. In our Presbyterian church, we had a very remarkable deaconess called Hilary McDowell. She died in December of disabilities. And uh, she only began to walk on crutches when she reached the age of eight. After she was born, her parents were told by the, the hospital staff that she would only live at no more than three weeks. Her mum asked them, well, what, what should I do? And they said to her, take her home, love her and bury her. Hilary went on to be a deaconess in our church. She wrote seven books. She produced a number of Christian dramas. She travelled to Singapore, the USA, and across Europe. And this is what she wrote before she died. Every child deserves life. She concludes, I'm wanting in a humble way to be the voice of the baby crying out and saying, I'm here, I'm alive, I want to live. Human life is sacred. And it's not for us to choose when to take life. It, that choice and that determination belongs to God. Then secondly, it follows from this truth that we are created in the image of God that every human being is of equal value. My father was a very moderate man when it came to politics. He did not get involved in politics really in any way. He concentrated on his job as an architect and a lay preacher. But I well remember in my early teens going with him down to Killalay. He had been involved in a, a small accident and he went to visit the family uh, involved in that accident. And after he had talked to them and we were driving back, I remember my father turning to me and saying, you know, they are Roman Catholics, but they're not really bad people. Now, my father was not instinctively sectarian. But I think he imbibed what many of us here in Ulster imbibe with our mother's milk, that we who are Protestant are superior to those who are from a Roman Catholic background. That is not Christian. Every human being is equal to God. I grew up in the village of Crossgar in County Down, and I went to Down High School. Uh, there was another school, it was a Protestant school, there was another school in Downpatrick called the Red High, which catered for Roman Catholic children. And every morning we waited for the bus. There was a group of us in green uniform, we were known as the Green High, and a group who were in red uniform, and we stood at least 20 yards apart. And we seldom spoke, because somehow we felt there was a difference, a distinction you know, it's not enough to say black lives matter. All lives matter. Whatever the color of skin, whatever community we come from, whether we're young or old, whether we're highly gifted or suffering limitation, every person, every human being is of equal value to God. And then thirdly, it follows from this truth that we are the crowning priests of God's creation, that we are precious to our Heavenly Father. In his book, All Things New, Pete Hughes includes uh, this story about Mother Teresa. Let me read it to you. Mother Teresa d demonstrated this understanding of humanity crowned with glory and honour in the most profound way. She was once visited by a journalist from the UK wanting to write a piece about her work in the slums of Kolkata. One day they found a beggar on the street with open wounds and maggots eating away at the rotting flesh. 
The beggar was undoubtedly dying, but the nuns wanted to provide this man with a comfortable and dignified death. <clears throat> they took him back to their base and nursed his wounds. The journalist then took Mother Teresa aside to explain how deeply unstrategic it was for them to be nursing a dying man who had no chance of surviving, particularly when they could be searching the streets to find people who they might genuinely be able to rescue. Mother Teresa gently responded that their role and mission was to provide dignity to people, whether in life or at the point of death. The journalist and Mother Teresa returned to the beggar's bedside for the final few moments of his life. His last words revealed the impact of the sister's ministry. He simply said, All my life I've lived like a dog. Today I die like a king. The radical hospitality and love of these humble sisters in Calcutta provides a reminder to the church the mission we have been entrusted with is not adding value to something worthless, but restoring value to something priceless. Our society, I believe, is full of people who are hurting, who don't like themselves and don't really value themselves. And this is probably, possibly because from an early age they have been maybe told over and over again that they're stupid, they're lazy, or they're ugly, or maybe they've been verbally abused or sexually abused, but they don't like themselves. They have suffered failure and rejection. We want to tell you this morning that whoever you are and whatever you, your past, you are precious to your heavenly Father. Then fourthly, it follows from what we're thinking about, that God is in the business of restoring his image in us. David reminds us that in the beginning, God created us in his own image. But isn't it true that something has gone terribly wrong? Human history is both a wonderful and sad story. Alongside wonderful achievements, history has been marked by terrible crimes. In many ways, people reflect the caring and creative nature of God. But unfortunately, they also have been known to display a depth of evil, which is not even seen in the animal world. We, we just have to refer to our news broadcasts over these last years. Terrible crimes being created, people being enslaved again, for sexual abuse and sexual pleasure. We could list many of these crimes, too horrendous even to mention. What has gone so terribly wrong? In the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, the, the prophet is told by God to go to a potter's shop. And in the potter's shop, he watches the potter making a pot. But the pot is flawed, it's not, it's not right, there's a flaw in it, and the potter smashes it and starts to remake uh, uh, the pot over again. And what God was saying to Jeremiah and what he wanted him to say to his people of his day was that God recognizes that we are flawed and broken, but he wants to remake us. Jeremiah lived at a time when Israel had rejected God. Their society was marked by idol worship, by religious prostitution, by the sacrifice of children, by violence and exploitation. They had wandered far from their covenant relationship with God. And, and so Jeremiah warns his people that God will, if they don't turn from their wicked ways, he will come and break them, and then he will remake them. As human beings, we have been created 
in the image of God. But our relationship with God has been broken. And we have brought many idols into our lives, distorting the image of God in our lives, destroying society and condemning us to eventual destruction. But the gospel, the good news, is that God is in the business of restoring us to be what we are. And what are we? Verses 6, 7 and 8. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swam the paths of the sea. We live in a broken and flawed world, but God is in the business of restoring and will restore his world and his universe, but he wants to begin in us. He wants to restore us so that we can share with him in exercising his rule in his new creation. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new crea- the, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. God wants to recreate us, to be what we are, the crowning piece of his creation. And that begins to happen when we acknowledge our fallenness and our failures, and when we welcome God's spirit into our lives. That same spirit which was involved in the creation of the world and the universe, that same spirit which raised Christ from the dead is the spirit that wants to invade our lives and help uh, and begin the process of remaking us to reflect both the image and the nature of God. The psalmist says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let us pray together. And can I suggest to you this morning and invite you to say something to God Can I suggest that you should say, Lord, I am special. Wherever you are, at this moment, can I encourage you to repeat those words, Lord, I am special because you created me. then I think we should ask God to help us to accept ourselves as God accepts us. Let's ask God to forgive us for the anger and bitterness and jealousy that tarnish the image of God in us. Then the second thing I think we want to say in prayer is, Lord, every person is special. Because you created every person in your image. Lord, every person is special. Help me to love my neighbor because he or she is your child and your creation. I have noticed <clears throat> that when I think about my thought life and my attitudes, the things I criticize in others, the resentments I hold are because I see in others things that I don't like in myself. Lord, forgive us as individuals and as a people where we have discriminated where we have verbally abused, where we have publicly criticized. Lord, our Lord, 
how majestic is your name in all the earth. And as we continue in prayer, we bring to you, Lord, our overseas family. And we think today of people who are serving others in all kinds of different situations from all kinds of backgrounds. And we thank you that you made them all. And we just mentioned before you this morning the people with whom we particularly identify, we, we think of uh, Steve and Sandy Davies uh, in the OM headquarters in England, and we ask that you will bless them as they uh, work with new people joining that organisation. We think of Stephen Cowan away up in the north of Kenya, and we pray that you will bless him as he trains local people up there in sanitation and construction and agriculture and so many things that are important during these particular days. We think of his wife Angelina at home with family. We pray for Nicola and Ezekiel in Burundi as they balance homeschooling for their own children alongside the needs of their local community there. We think of Heather and David Charland working in health and agriculture in Uganda and Colin and Marjorie at home on leave but we think of their college where they work and of the church there where they work, We're reaching out to refugees in such need during these days. And we pray for Alvin and Sonia as they have time off this month. We pray that you will refresh them in mind and body and soul. We thank you, Father, for your worldwide family. And we bring all of these today to you and ask for your blessing upon them in the days that lie ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now Gareth and Nina are going to lead us in song again. And it's really a prayer which picks up the themes that we've been thinking about today.
Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, during the time that uh, Alvin is away on holiday, if you need any pastoral care, then please refer to the church's webpage or the information on Facebook. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Both now and tomorrow, the weeks ahead and forevermore. Amen.